Welcome to episode five of Social Currency, your podcast for tech, venture, and entertainment. Let's jump in. We're going to talk about something a little light today. Start off the podcast, NCAA tournament. Okay. Kick it off, Daliente. Oh, we're going to start with the women's? The women's. I'm sorry, you, you fell asleep yesterday, so <laughs> you can't <laughs> you couldn't even stay up. You couldn't even stay up for the... I took a nap to watch the tournament. <laughs> and then just, just slept, slept through the whole thing. thing. You so missed you, out on He was in the minority because this was the most watched female collegiate game in history of NCAA. <laughs> missed out on history, man. All right, so just jump into Caitlin Clark. <laughs> I know she had 40. Her, she had a 40 piece. She had 41. She had she a 40, 40 piece. One. Put them away. Angel Reese had a strong first half. She did. She came out, you know, fast break, layup, screaming, torn, doing her thing, stealing the ball. But then Caitlin Clark came out as an assassin. We talk, we talk about Steph Curry a lot. This might be the female Steph Curry I've seen. No, I've seen. I don't. I never. I don't like the go to rising player comparisons. I never like those. Like the Anthony Edwards, Michael to Jordan, Jordan comparison. I think it's too soon. That's but, but, but we're not. Smith. We're not talking about. You know, no, no, no. Absolutely. We're not talking about careers. We're just talking about the game style. Yeah, the way they play the game. That's why they said 85 Jordan, because it's not Michael Jordan from like the Bulls when he was winning. It was like how Jordan came in from New York and see how he's athletic, how he could jump out the gym. That's what Anthony Edwards is looking like. Just a little bit bigger. Like raw talent, like just raw, raw like you see raw talent and you just see his potential is through the roof. Let's not even disrespect the women's game. Let's go back to Kaylin. <laughs> no, yeah, we can back to yeah. But she plays like Steph Curry. I just I've seen it last night, like pulling up from anywhere, even the passes. She might do some all scheduled passes like stuff. He could get sloppy sometimes. She got sloppy a little bit last night. So she's a, that's her comp right now, Steph Curry. I'm not going to say she got the career. She got to put the work in. She got to get drafted. She got to do all of that. But her game's similar. Her game play right now is similar, reminiscent of the so, chef. So they already have her in the WNBA. They announced that it's going to be her, Sabrina Nescu, Steph, and Clay in the three-point shootout in the Bay Area next year. That's they did? Announced. They, really? did they announced that already? They announced that today. Okay, so I, so I, so I didn't even see that. He was up for that one. I didn't see that one. So yeah, I didn't see that. I didn't see so that. So clearly, yeah, she's already a, w, a WNBA player. Oh, yeah, she probably saw and the number one. The tournament's one. not even over yet. So that's like Stan. She's already in the tournament. I mean, it was it was even regardless of the season being over, she was definitely going to the WNBA. Like, But actually, before we even get into all of that, let's shout out to everybody, um, everybody that's participated in um, the Elite Eight and that's going on in the Final Four. So shout out to USC. Shout out to Juju. You know, you had a great freshman season. You know, keep your head up. Don't Records. let none of that stuff. So wrong. Don't wrong. let none of that stuff affect you. Keep it going. You got a bright, bright future, Juju. Like you, you're gonna be out this world. Like you're a freshman. Like think about the impact that you came in and had as a freshman. You put the world on notice. So you, I'm pretty sure you can go break Caitlin's record. So if I was you, I would make that make that a goal. I know she kind of set the bar a little high, but I I believe that she can break it. Um, who else was in the thing? Wait, so you saw Juju play in person. What would I you did. say? What would, what would you say the difference is seeing her in person as opposed to the TV screen? She's a lot. She's a little bit taller than I expected. <laughs> yeah, she's like six two. Yeah, she's a, she's definitely a little taller than I expected. Um, she her game is just she, she her game is just dope. Like she could do whatever the game asks for. Um, she could pull up. She could shoot from deep. She could get to the basket. Her euro step. She, she's very talented. I went to go see her um, last game of the season, um, Arizona State. Um, she, she's, she, she has a bright future. So I, I really, I really uh, shout, shout out to her. Um, I know they took a tough loss yesterday um, to UConn, but look, they lost to somebody that's also great. You know, Paige Bukers and um, the UConn Huskies, you know, they're coached by Gino. Gino is a legend. He's been doing this for God knows how long. He that God is. knows how long. He, he, might, he might be the GOAT of women's Exactly. Coaching. Like, he's Gino Ariam has been doing this for a long time. UConn's been in back-to-back, back-to-back, Final Fours, dominating the tournament. They've been doing it for a long time. So, shout-out to UConn women's basketball. And they um, had a, a depleted team yesterday. They had a lot of injuries. Did. AZ Fudd, uh, uh, AZ Fudd, she wasn't even playing. She's one of their star players. She's coming back off of ACL. Um... Who else, who else uh, do they have? I don't know who else they have, but I know they had like three, four freshmen. Yeah, that that wasn't even, injuries. you know. Well, but what's attracting you guys to the, the women's game? Like, no I'll tell, hold on, before before yeah. we get there, I'll tell you. Paige and Juju was guarding each other. That's I was what, like, what is, I haven't seen this in the NBA in how long? Steph's not guarding uh, Dame or, you know, I haven't KD, seen KD the and LeBron. Yeah, KD, I'm going to say KD and LeBron, they guard each other every now and then. 
when maybe when crunch time, LeBron and Kawhi, that should, that should be hold that should be every every moment of the game. You say you the best, right? Right. Nah, Paige took on that challenge yesterday. To see oh. star on star was different. That's exactly. Different so game. so the men, that's that's and that makes the and we're talking from a fan perspective. We're not even talking about like trying to big or try to like belittle anybody. We're talking from a fan entertainment perspective. When the stars, you guys are people, those people are the stars of the game. People pay big money, save up a lot of money to come see y'all play. We need to see y'all go against each other. Not this passive aggressive, oh, we friends up. No, bro, like we come in, we come in to compete. So that's where I think the women's college game is like why it's getting so much attention is because they're really competing. Like they're competing. So like, it's reminiscent of like the Kobe, Trace and the Grady days. Exactly. Like Margaret versus Jason Kidd. Exactly. Like they're really good. Look at the games yesterday. Angel Reese and um, LSU was really good, and Falaji and Falaji they was going at uh, Iowa. Like you know what I'm saying? It was a back and forth game. But then you know, Caitlin showed why she's really good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like she showed, she said, "Okay, y'all, y'all did y'all thing." I'm a, she came out in the second half and hit like two big threes. You know what I'm saying? So she, you know what I mean? That's the competition that we want to see. And then in the second game, you had, like he said, you had UConn and uh, USC going at it. You had Paige. Juju, um, you have uh, Mackenzie Forbes going. Um, oh, yeah, you know, Forbes. yeah, Forbes. She's really good too. Har- she went to Harvard too. Um, shout out to Harvard. Um, she transferred to Harvard. Went to finish her the last year at uh, USC. But also another thing that's good about the, the women's games we, we want to touch on is the coaching. Like you just touched on Gino. Y'all talk about Dawn Staley. Now she, they, they're undefeated this year. South Carolina Gamecocks. Y'all talk about uh, she's a legend. Tara Vanderveer, San Sanford, a legend. Y'all talk about well, who's the coach on the. Uh, the team that displayed yesterday, um, from from what school? Oh, oh from USC, uh, LSU. Oh, yeah, LSU. Uh, yeah, they won the championship last year. Kim Mulkey. These are Kim. legendary coaches that's coaching right now. That's, that's propelling the game to new heights that you know they haven't seen before. Shout out to Iowa's coach too. I forget, I forget her name because she's she's doing oh, yeah, a lot. She's, too. She's a good I, I just forget her name off the top of my head. But shout out to her too. She's doing a lot of great things um, with that team, and she's taking them far with. You know, just kind of like one headline name player. She used to, that, that still takes coaching. You get what yeah, I'm saying? That still does. takes coaching. That still takes coaching. Yeah. So, I, and personally, just to answer your question, what makes the women's game so entertaining too is because it's fundamentals based. A lot, you know, they have to do their fund. They have to, you know, focus mm-hmm. on the fundamentals because they're not as athletic. They're not as athletic as how guys are. Guys can get away with, you know, their athletic sometimes and not rely on the fundamentals, but... You know, females, they're still growing in that aspect of athleticism. They can't jump out the gym like how and talking about Anthony Edwards. They can't jump out the gym like him. So you can kind of get away with not getting the fundamentals off but in a men's game. But in women's, they got to fundam- the fundamentally sound. And that's exciting to watch. They run real plays. They're running like, you know what I'm saying? It's not just iso ball, oh, one against one. No, they have to like run real plays to get in. You, you know what I mean? Do you think the... Women's game is going to see an influx of women fans five years from now. You think they're going to come immediately? Because a lot of the fans seem to be men crossing over and watching women's sports. That's a good question. I think I think women's I think women's will start trending more to it once they once the money once the money really starts to pour in and it gets investment real like real investment. And why I'm saying that is because you know it's still like a um, one is still growing, and then. I think the thing is too, we just need more women's basketball players and more women bigging it up. The women's game. Because like I think I like talked about celebrities? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, like celebrities, exactly. Um because what cause what um cause what made women's sports so popular or kind of got it on that trend. Remember what Kobe what, everything that Kobe yeah. was doing for the game. With Gigi, yeah. You know what I'm saying? God rest their soul. Like the, what they were doing for the game. He was trying to push that forward because he saw what he he saw the greatness in his daughter, and was preparing her for the opportunity that God rest her soul she didn't get to have. But you know, he was pushing it forward. So now we need more women to kind of come in and say, "Hey, like, no, this is a good route." And one, and what I mean by the investments, once they see that this is a lucrative career, I'm pretty sure you're going to start seeing more women putting on jerseys and <laughs> wanting to start shooting basketballs. But something I wanted to touch on, I could actually play into that is I think it's so much easier to market a woman with the NIL deals like it's so much easier to market Angel Reese or Caitlin Clark than it is uh like I, I don't know any DJ uh DJ uh the the guy from NC State like I don't even know any no, no male college players yeah. I feel like it's so much easier to market the women to mainstream media 
than it is the guys. Because, you know, girls are pretty, they got more personality, they could do all type of creative things that guys maybe aren't as prone to do. And guys just got to be a little, you have to, you have to be a little bit more, because we, we went, their guys have to be a little bit more, um, like, how should I say? They have to be kind of like media savvy. Yeah, yeah. like media savvy and kind of like developed into that, you know, because some people, some, uh, it's like he's saying, it's just easier to like market, you know, women because they have men sometimes are shy to show their personality, you know, you should show your personality. It's cool because they don't want to be, they want to be, they don't scared to be judged. Oh, I'm going to get looked at this way. But yeah, a lot of women players are very well spoken. That um, too. At 18. <laughs> so it's like, and you don't get in trouble. Girls mature faster. Like, off the court, bro. yeah, like it's not the same. So it's yeah, it makes it. Makes, it's, there's a lot of different factors, but I think those are, you know, some factors that play, play into it. And right. like I said, once, once, once the like real, real big, big money starts coming into like women's sports in general, like I'm pretty sure there's gonna be more women fans. But there's women's fans in um, in women's soccer. Like I go to women, I go to a women's soccer league. You'll be surprised. There's like a lot of women fans supporting their local, um, you know, teams and everything. Like um, Angel City, I go. I, I normally go to Angel City FC in um, in LA. Like it's a dope. Yeah, it's a dope I, place. I definitely see it trending upwards. Did you want to touch on a little bit of college ball before we, we switch back into the tech topics? Uh, yeah, the guy from the guy from NC State. Uh, he he uh, talk about fundamentals. He's so elite at his post play, which is something that's a dying art. Yeah, the mm-hmm. memes online at the, was the uh, Spider-Man meme looking at, you know, it's Zach Randolph and he put it up at him. Yeah. Down, but I can see a little Zach Randolph. Of course. And you kind of look like him in the face, so that's a, that's an easy comparison. But even Hakeem, like his footwork is so elite that people wanted to play football. I'm like, wait a second. He, football is, O-line is a whole different challenge than just being on the court. Like, he should be given an opportunity. I don't care if the three ball is the dominant gameplay in the NBA. I don't care if He's not in condition. People could get him in condition. He got trainers for that. His skill set as an uh, as a post player is something that we need to get back to. We mm-hmm. need to have that balance. We can't. Everybody's not going to be shooting like stuff. Everybody can't do that. So you need to have some type of balance of a back to the basket, put the ball on the floor, and get an easy bucket. He is he dominated that yeah. game. He got them to the final four because of his post play. Yeah, Nobody yeah. can guard him. The crazy thing is he's not even projected to go high in the draft, and he said it's a weak draft. That should just kind of show you where the scouts are at. So like that again, the scouts are missing out on talent. So you're gonna pass up because the every, see the thing is this is the problem too. It's like a copycat league. So everybody sees oh they, I gotta shoot threes, I gotta shoot threes. But no, play good fundamental basketball, you will win. That's like so people think the Warriors. I will keep it real because I'm like uh, I keep it real. The Warriors, yes, they shoot threes and they're really good at shooting threes and everything. But at the the, the end of the day, That's they play good butter. fundamental basketball. Yeah. They play good fundamental, and it's not about lead and exactly like so. It's like that. Share the ball. That's the real essence of like real basketball. And then just getting touching on it, you know. The, shout out to the men's uh, on the men's side that made it to the Final Four. You know, you got Alabama, you got UConn, um, NC State. And uh, Purdue. and Purdue. Shout out to the big dude from Purdue too. Yeah, he yeah. like seven three. Yeah, another tree. He, he another tree. He He's another tree net. out no, there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he no is man. another tree out there. So the you know, shout out to the men's side. They they definitely really bought it this um this March Madness. I know we were talking about oh we didn't really know, but now nah, they they had the intensity, the energy, and I think it's gonna be a real good Final Four um, this coming weekend. So um, and the national championship next week. So just stay out for look on that college basketball March Madness. It's always some madness going on. Always some madness going on. And to just pay the guys. That's all we ask. Just pay them. <laughs> just right. pay the guys. Let's transition. So we are a tech pod, venture, entertainment. We want to talk about Beyonce. Last time I talked about Beyonce was episode one. No, it was episode two, actually. It's episode two? Miami. We was in Miami. Oh, we was in right. Miami. We was in Miami. Right. But she dropped um, Cowboy, Cowboy Carter. Carter. Mm-hmm. Have Let's you go. heard it? I have not heard it yet. <laughs> How you? I'm late. I'm late on album. When you come out, give me a week. Yeah, we, Madly, we, like, has anybody heard it? You heard it? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What's your favorite song? Uh, spaghetti. Okay. Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Right now. It could I change tomorrow. Okay. Every other day. Yeah, not that album. What's your favorite song on the album? Bodyguard. Okay, he got. <laughs> Bodyguard and Jolene. Jolene right, was good too. Jolene, Jolene yeah, was good I heard too. Heard sixteen. What's the sixteen carriages? Yeah, but that's that's. That was that the, was the single. Exactly, yeah, the single. But yeah. it's. it's, it's, it's Okay. Yeah, I like the song Bodyguard. Um, 
I just like how she's like, one, I like how she marketed it because everybody thought she was gonna just go um, super country. Like she did, but like- Which caused I, controversy. Exactly. Before it even came out. It, before it even came out, that's good marketing. Um, and then, um, but she just showed that like, no, like this is a Beyonce album, like I'm versatile. Like I could do whatever is asked. Like if you want me to go country, I could do it. If you want me to rap, look, people forget like, yo, she's she was bodying Jay-Z on the Carter's album. Go listen to that album. She was bodying Jay-Z on a couple of verses. Like she really was doing her thing. Like don't get it twisted. She's, she could do whatever is asked. You know what I mean? So. Exactly. Like don't, don't get it twisted. She definitely has, um. Some good, she's, we all know Beyonce's a performer, Beyonce's talented, but I think with this, she's just kind of solidifying, like, you know, exactly, like, she is the genre, like, you know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not uh, country, <laughs> R&B, no, it's Beyonce. It's Beyonce. <laughs> it's Beyonce, like, no, seriously, because she's doing, she could do whatever, and has been doing whatever. So, has talking been doing about whatever. Beyonce, her album's so big that tech forums are talking about her. Like, they, they were talking about her in the sense that, this, this album was her stance against like AI. There's a couple of generative AI tools that came out, like uh, Stability AI, I think is one, and a couple others where they mi can mimic your voice, different things, they okay. generate music. Obviously the music industry's rollout of the, the fake artists last year or what, two years ago was, was bad, but it's gonna come back. They're gonna try again. Mm -hmm. They're gonna try to do it again. But this was like, you can never mimic someone that's that great. You can't. No, you can't. It's a limit to computers, limit to robots and stuff like that, especially when real creativity. And that's what, and what, what were we talking about? I forgot what episode it was. I told you the way to, the way to outpace AI, or it's not even outpace, it's just like, I just said it, I said it on the last episode, like human creativity is gold. Like you, you're, you can't beat that. They could create all these artificial things, but human creativity, human thought process, human, like that you can't so, emulate that. So tech companies are smart, and there's a lot of tech companies in the music industry, like YouTube Music and a couple others. Suppose you just start decoupling an artist. I mean by that is taking their teams away, getting writers. Maybe they get somebody who wrote on Cobb and Carter. You start doing things like that. How does that affect the landscape? It's just okay. You just gotta adapt, but still, but still, even with that, you cannot emulate human creativity. Like if somebody's a great artist that's been doing this for 30 years, just because some new AI tool came out, that doesn't mean that they're gonna get replaced. No, like, you know, you have to be, not, like you have to be, like Benny the Butcher said it on um, uh, how to rap. Like, like you gotta, first you gotta be nice with it. Like he starts off the song, like first you gotta be nice with it. Like it's not no, like you know what I'm saying? Like you can't, this is not no computer generated rap. Hold on, something he said before, before we went to, a couple weeks ago, off camera. You say you don't have to be nice. You're saying somebody like Ice Spice, who could just get buzz off of like social media marketing, personality type stuff like that. She's one of the top artists right now. So do you have to be nice? Yeah, I mean, she nice? no, don't get it twisted. She's talented. Ice Spice is talented. But what the problem is is that you could get. This is why I think we were just talking about it. Would you rather the thing the, the thing that artists, especially new artists coming out, you really have to ask yourself this question. Do you just want to be hot or do you want to be a slow burner? So, you know what I'm saying? That's a real question. She kind of, she kind of, I know, I think she said she was making music for like a year or so. And then she got hot with that song Munch. That's fast. You know what I'm saying? And then she rose her stardom so fast. Now you're getting put in a light where you kind of got to deliver for rap fans. We're talking about like real rap fans. You can go do your thing doing uh, partnerships, but we're talking about real rap. People got to remember, you get back the music, the music is the entry to everything else. Mm -hmm. Even a perfect example is Kanye. You mean? It, at, the, at the essence, he goes into fashion, everything, but he still goes back to the music because that's what gave him the pathway into everything else. You got, it, it starts with the music. It's not, you got to be nice. You got to be nice. If you want the longevity, if you want the longevity, you gotta be nice. Like you gotta be nice. It, it, all that other gimmicky social media stuff, yeah, it'll, it'll have you in a thing for a long time. A perfect example is Little Pump. I don't even wanna, I don't even wanna give artists, I'm, I'm not trying to give no pub like that, but J. Cole said it on 1985. A couple years from now, you're gonna be on uh, them, them um, hip hop uh, reunion hip -hop. joints. You know what I'm saying? He said it because he, you can't, you can't, outpace and you can't outlast these people that have 
really dedicated their life to perfecting the craft. Okay, let's take it away from like our generation. Let's say the labels like our we messed up the world last year with the generative AI tool. Let's try to do something like um, lo-fi music, right? We go on YouTube and put like background music. Let's like make an artist like that that targets kids who are currently like maybe 10 years old or something, like little kids, and get them kind of brainwashed a little bit to think that that's an artist, that's what an artist is, versus getting attached to a cultural person like a Beyonce or someone that they probably listen to like Ice Spice. You see what I'm saying? Like how does, can AI trick Younger folks, and it's I'll like, ask this, this I'll, how an, an artist should sound and be. I'll ask this question: Who dictates? Who dictates music and uh, the acceptance of music? Labels or the artists? Especially in twenty twenty four. I still think the labels do. How? They're the ones who are saying listen to these people. How? You're choosing to go listen to them, not the label. So you're letting the label market to you and tell you who to go listen to. It's like it's they their rosters are so full. They're gonna find somebody that attracts them. To them. It's definitely but, a, it's definitely the artist. It can't it, it, like it's it's the like you're talking okay. For who what name a major art name a major label artist that uh, that uh, people uh, that they're they're telling or pushing you to go listen to. Who's what label is she on? What label is she on? Well, yeah, what label she's on? <coughs> I think she's on Republic. But we could check. See, nobody knows. But you know Taylor Swift. But they push Taylor Swift on us. I mean, she just hit a billionaire yesterday. I mean, Taylor Swift is great. I like Taylor Swift. She's not bad. Um, I think the reason why they're pushing her, to be frank, is because what happened with her, what happened with her deal situation and her master situation. Um, so they're just trying to from a business perspective, from a labels perspective, they're just trying to recoup that money that she was owed um, for her masters being sold without her even knowing. And the crazy thing about it, I think even Steve South said it on his interview with Shannon Sharp. Her father supposedly, I don't know how true this is, but this is what they were saying. <laughs> her father owned a part of that company that bought the masters. So the fact that her father knew that her masters was being sold and didn't tell her, that's crazy. You get what I'm saying? So. I guess they're just, I guess so she learned the business, the ins and out of it, and now she's just, that's why she released, re-released everything, saying Taylor's version, because she didn't own the rights to her music. I think that's what artists need to start thinking about, instead of trying to get behind these major labels. Let's separate it. I think we choose cultural people of relevance, like okay. uh, Brent Fias, but I think the labels choose who's in the top 10, top 20. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's a good you way know, to look at it. The people who are really getting pushed out. That's, that's a good way to look at it. Because there's definitely a lot of great... So if they decide, hey, we're going to put in our top 20 or top 10 an AI artist to compete with Beyonce's <laughs> album that just dropped, like, how does that look in five years? Because I think that's going to be a really serious conversation. But there's no... But there's no AI... Like, what, name a good AI, AI artist. No, you're saying they can make one. They can make one. They can produce one. N name... Who? Like, how? How? If you started out young, that's what companies you try to start out young and kind of grow you into liking it. And, but... Like you said, like like you said, it's a cultural relevance thing. So if it's not a, it's not a culture that ARs can't come and do a commercial and you know meet, do creative things that artists could do. They can't do that. That's what I'm it's saying. Just, it's just background music. Exactly. They can't push that for real. Even artists died. They could post the AI versions. Yes, and they will. But they already they already have that following they because will. they were actual person first. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like yeah, like I I don't I, like I said. Human creativity, if you want to be AI, human creativity is exponential. You your human creativity has to be exponential. Has to be exponential. And um, it is, like, especially in, you know, black culture. You know, I'll keep it real. Like, that's, that's one of America's best exports. That's, that's a fact. That's one of America's best exports is black culture. You're just in an Uber driving to trap Indian beats because that's a, a hip hop Facts. influence. You feel me? We got Indi people in India rapping in Indian over over trap beats. Where do you think they learned that from? That was the experience, though. You know what I'm saying? That and that's dope. And the music was dope. I mean, I wish I understood what he was saying, <laughs> but you know, that's that's that that's that's the real relevance that's gonna push everything. All that AI stuff, like, yeah, it's cool, they'll attempt it, but once they realize it's not gonna make money in the long run, because at the end of the day, that's what these companies want, they want to make money, 
Um, and once they realize that, okay, it's a cool gimmick, but we're talking about longevity, no, like that's not gonna make money. Is Beyonce independent or she's who she signed to? She's not, I don't think she's independent. She's not, I don't think she's she independent. Columbia? Columbia. Okay, that's like a real good transition. Gamma, I wanna talk about Gamma, because we talked about Usher in episode three, right? Correct. So we didn't talk about his label. <laughs> or actually, shout out to Larry Johnson, is, he's saying it's not a label. This is like the new medium of how to push, push artists. artists. So it's a creative agency. They have equity and funding. So again, we're tech, venture, and entertainment. Why? Because this is happening in the and, ecosystem. Yeah, right now. Right? And this is like, I kind of tell you guys off camera how I would operate my music stuff. This is very similar to how Larry Johnson is doing it. Um, mm. So Gamma has Usher. So that's why he was excited. I'm like, what's about Gamma? Okay. <laughs> Has Usher, Rick Ross, which is great. And I was trying to figure out why did he go after established acts, right? Instead of trying to maybe convince like Brent Fias. I know he turned down a couple deals. How do I get someone who's emerging? He went and opted for an established act. And when we talked about Usher in episode three, we talked about that him coming back out and it took four or five years. I'm like, you know what? Usher's established, but he's not. He's just uh, has a new energy around him, mm -hmm. right? New fan fresh is fresh. He's active and probably had a new fan base as well. Because an, an emerging artist in five years would not be able to do the Super Bowl like Usher just did. Mm -hmm. So from the perspective of him starting and launching something new, that was genius. And now he can add an emerging artist now too. But what do you think about the emergence of folks saying this is not a label, the way they're going about operating, getting funding, coming from his background, I think he was at Apple, like this new medium of music. And I'm not even talking about Web3 stuff too, because I think he's also saying that they're going to dive into Web3. Ooh, that would make They're sense. They're going to dive into these. It's not the standard music rollout. Of, mm -hmm. An artist comes out like Tyla with Water. Mm -hmm. Came out with a record, let it run. Then I do an album. Then I'm going to do a tour. I'm going to drop merch. They're so, I keep saying, this is so played out. It's so refreshing to see someone say, no, this is how it's going to work the next 10 years. I mean, but chill though, because Tyler, shout out to Tyler. Her album is fire. Water is fire. You got to you gotta chill with that. You got to chill. Tyler's joint was fire. And her, her, her shit was fire. Answer your question is two things. One, the reason why you don't want to probably come out and just say your label, because you're boxing yourself in. And now with technology and integrating with different, for, different technologies, platforms. you can different platforms, you'll probably get more, you'll be more attractive to an investor if you come out and brand yourself I don't want to say you. You uh, let me let me rephrase this. You will limit yourself in funding and limit yourself in growth if you say and just come out and say I'm a music label, because there's gonna because with all these emerging technologies, there's gonna be so many uh, integration pathways that you could get your music out that you don't have to necessarily be a label. The labels are gonna have to adapt. That's why I asked at the beginning, who's who's really who makes the culture represent? Is it the label or is it the artist? Second, to answer your question about the Usher thing, the biggest thing and the biggest, um, to, for me, this is my opinion, the biggest thing as an artist that you need to have to have, um, you know, that long staying power is catalog. Usher has a catalog. So when you're dealing with an emerging artist, they're still building that catalog. And your catalog is like your most valuable asset. You know, that's why people be like, you keep making music, keep dropping. That's why I fuck with Russ's idea of like dropping music every week, every because at the end of the day, you're building up your asset portfolio, which is your catalog of music. And now if it's really good and something hits, like you have like a big record, people are gonna go back into your catalog and be like, oh, wow, this other shit was actually fire too. Then and that's how you monetize the music. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. But it is a fire idea to have a whole new approach because the, like you said, the whole system is outdated. It's, it's, you know, prehistoric. So the whole new approach is to say it's an agency and not a label. That's what we need more of in the industry, more creativity, more outside the box thinking. It's, it's, I also like it because it adds more, especially people of color, to think about if he kind of blows up Gamma, Steve Stout's the United Masters. It's like setting a precedent. Also, he bought uh, Vidya, which is another distro. It's like distro kid. It's Who, like, the United Masters? Uh, no. no, Gamma. Oh, Gamma did? Okay. Yeah, they purchased it. So that's, hmm. I think, going to be the distribution model. Exactly. See and the it, way he's like stacking this up, like Lego pieces, is kind of crazy. That's the integration. That's the integration part we're talking about. Now we, we was even talking about off camera. Everybody's really you know, typically how the how the standard is is like everybody releases on a Friday, you know things like that. 
we remember you when CDs was out in the thing, we used to drop on Tuesdays or we used to drop on different days. So now with this independent wave and this independent artist is emerging or independent labels or independent businesses, I should say, um, that's not major, necessarily backed by a major label. Um, you can have creative releases that can attract the fan base. Like I think we were saying, imagine if somebody dropped on a Sunday, had like 300, 400 downloads, and then now they're charting. You're gonna go to the thing and be like, yo, who's this? How the hell did they, how the hell did they drop on a Sunday and get all this traction? So that's, I think we gotta be, and that, what is that goes back to? Human creativity superseding the AI bullshit. I don't, I don't wanna say bullshit, it's not bullshit. AI is definitely a it's really a great tool. It's definitely a really great tool, but when it comes to like making music and stuff like that, that's more creativity than it is like computer generated. And unfortunately for our audience, and I guess fortunately, we're going to keep talking about AI because uh, it's a trillion dollar business. It's not a, yeah, it's a trillion, a, a trillion dollar, trillion dollar business, not billion. He said a trillion, trillion dollar business and we have, by 2030. And 2030 is like yeah. five years away. And we haven't uh, dived into it too much yet in terms of all the different branches of AI, but we will in a coming episode. It's just a lot to unpack. But yeah, music and tech, man, it's, it's, uh, it's going. It's going. It's going. I like it personally. I mean, I like I like I like how I like the um honestly, you know what I think? With the emergence of AI, I think it's gonna force it's gonna force people to be more creative. So all those artists that they was talking about plants, that you'd be like, oh, this art is a plant, it's gonna probably eliminate those type of artists because you gotta actually be creative now. Like, nah, like how are you creative in your rollout? How are you creative in your music? Who's your producer? You don't, you know what I'm saying? Like things like that, it, it forces you to be creative. It forces you to figure out a different way of how can I get out into the audience? How can I uh, catch a listener's ear? Opposed to the major labels just telling me, oh, this person is hot, I should go listen to them. Nah, they don't work that way. Unrelated, you had a question about emerging artists and established artists dropping music in the same time frame. You, do you wanna jump into that a little bit? Yeah, we can. Um, that's actually a perfect segue. So how do you compete, or I guess, or be creative in what major label drops? So if a major, if somebody's big, for example, Beyonce, she dropped on 329. So there's like a new emerging artist. Well, give the context. Because, okay. Because back in the day, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he's right. He's right. I have to give the context about it. Back in the day, in the 90s and the early 2000s, artists like Jay-Z, Lauryn Hill, DMX um, would all drop on the same day. Okay. And Outkast would all drop on the same day. How come nobody does that anymore? People would be like, oh, you got to move off my release date. Da-da-da. It was not even a competition thing. Everybody would go listen to all of those artists. So how come that's not like what's the, how come that's not a thing anymore? Like how come Kanye, Drake, Kendrick, Cole all can't drop on the same day? Especially in the streaming era, because back in the day, hold on one second, because back in the day I can understand not not stepping on people's release date because we had to physically go spend money and physically go to somewhere to buy the CD. Now everything is digital. All I got to do is go on Apple Music, Spotify, Tidal, um, all these different streaming platforms, and click play. So why can't all these big artists drop on the same day? But that serves the unknown artists because now if you put, if I drop on the same day as Beyonce, I'm in the same category as Beyonce, like same area as Beyonce. Because people are gonna see Beyonce, they're gonna see my song. You feel me? But back in the day, they have to actually go and spend the money. So that's what they will move away from that. But now everything is digital. Oh, I could drop the same. It probably would behoove them because, like I said, in the same, they're in the same day, same category, same area. I'm right there. I'm gonna just stream that next to. On title, I don't know how it is on on Spotify and other platforms. On title, everybody drops the same, you know, the same day, same time. You get to see, um, you you kind of um, for he's speaking from a title. I, I use Apple Music. I mean, I like title too, um, but I use Apple Music. So on Apple Music, when an artist drops, especially like a big name artist, and it's like best, and it's like new albums, it's gonna have all the new albums that came out that same day as well too. Like yes, you probably can get placement, but like you saying you can still discover somebody else because all that traffic that Beyonce created on that day is gonna be in that ecosystem of like, oh, who else dropped? Like after you listen to her, even though her album was really long, it was 27 songs, but it's like, okay, who else dropped? Who else music can I, can I listen to? Who else can I discover? 
So from a marketing aspect, depending on how the rollout is, you can kind of position yourself next to that big artist and maybe get discovered. It's, it's still, it's still, a, it's still a, uh, up to the listener, per se. I think I'm on the other side. I, of what? I don't think, if you're a virgin, I don't think it's your job the same day as an established artist. Why not? I think it takes away from your, your, your entire rollout. Because it's like a, it's a build up to that day and then there's like a post-launch activities. And that post-launch, if you launch after Beyonce, they're talking about Beyonce. You know, like let's take a small artist. Let's do somebody else. Who's a mid-level artist you can think of? Anybody. Like mid-level. Dochi? Yeah, Dochi? I would say Dochi. Okay, let's do Summer Walker. Like, okay, Summer Drop maybe. Like depending on how much traction we have as an emerging artist, but still... Like, if this is like, a, she rolled out a music video that went kind of viral, if she had a feature on it, you're, you're, you're going to go ghost. Like, they're going to go mess with that and not with your stuff. Like, it kind of becomes your day online, like your digital uh, playground for the next two weeks because no one's dropped. Maybe it's a dead season. Uh, maybe artists are coming out in a couple of weeks and you kind of have the calendar. You can say, all right, I'm going to come here. I can get a little bit of traction before that. And also, maybe you uh, garner attention from, from bigger artists because you dropped before them. I don't know, I don't think dropping on the same day like benefits you. Maybe. Again, I think it depends where you're at. Like if you know you can Yeah, I don't well, think Summer Walker should you, doubt, but somebody un, like un, I never heard of you before. But now I see your album because I'm here, I'm looking at a Beyonce album. But how prone is because you like music a lot, but someone who's like a casual listener who likes that who likes that particular artist, are they gonna click on somebody else now? I don't know. That's I mean it's to they me have a but, probability too. To me, it goes back to this. Like, yeah, I can see, I see where you're coming from, but it goes back to this. Okay, cool. You remember those artists? They're behind the machine. Like, they, they, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're gonna, regardless of whatever happens, they're good. But the up and coming artists, this is gonna give you more incentive to work your record, because this is, I think Tyler the Creator said this. There was like some, some thing they said online. People post their uh, album like once and think like, oh yeah, I did it. I post my album. No. Like we need to get back to the days where, especially if you're an independent artist, you need to work your record. Like you need, people need to get tired of like, yo, why does this dude keep sending me this shit? Like that's good marketing though. That's what people don't realize. Good marketing is like, yo, get out of my face. So that's why I kind of lean on the other side and say, no, you go, okay, yeah, you dropped on the same day as a big artist, but you got to work your record. People need to get back to working their record and, um, being a slow and, and being accepting of being a slow burner like people everybody wants to get viral and be hot but like i said i said it a little bit earlier in this episode as an artist you have to ask yourself do you want to be viral or do you want to be do you want to have longevity because everybody's in the game of being viral but the real game is that taking that 15 minutes and stretching it as far as you can that's that's the real game how do you do that? Look at the greats that's done it. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to, you have to understand that. Like take that 15 minutes that you got, and how do I extend it? But artists are just like, oh, I'm gonna go on TikTok, upload this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go viral. Okay, cool. You went viral. You got a million, two million yeah. views, but nobody cares because the craft itself. At the end of the day, it just goes back to this: what makes people great? It's not the views. It's not all of that. It's the content and the craft, like with the, the, the perfection of your craft. That's what makes the shit great, not the numbers. And the business, like Nami just said, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, learning the business. Yeah. You gotta, you, ha you have, people have to get back to the craft. But that's it's, actually, that's you actually, you actually get back to the craft. I had a question for you, for you guys, anybody. The, uh, so the big three uh, is kind of a battle right now that Kendrick has issues off the, the future drop. So is this, Drake going out? Is this the? Are we seeing the end of Drake right now? What do you mean? With Kendrick Cole and out Drake, and Cole, Cole got a little stray. Is this? Are we seeing the decline of? Are we finally seeing the decline of Drake? Because his last out, couple albums haven't been hitting like that. How do you ever see it? I'm a, I'm a little disagree. I'm gonna have to push back mm -hmm. on there. Drake's albums are still hitting. Not like they were. Not like they was before. In what sense? I can't even. Only song I know is uh, Rich was Rich Baby Daddy. That's because of Sexy Red. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, and I'm a, I like Drake. I use him as Drake, but his last, as of recent, his last, his couple joints is 
for me, it's not, it's not doing it. I just think um, in regards to that, I definitely don't think we're seeing a decline of Drake, but you know, I think Drake just knows his competition. How are you like, declining for your legend already? No, I'm saying this is the end. Kendrick calling him out. He still hasn't responded from way back. Like, because that's what I'm saying. Drake just knows his competition. In my opinion, I would, that's how I would think. Drake knows his competition. He knows he can't just come out with anything for Kendrick because Kendrick, he, that's a sleeping monster. And if you wake him up, you know, you better be ready because, you know, Kendrick could go off for days. Okay, so you guys still got Drake at, as the top guy. It's not even a matter of Drake being the top guy. It's just like we're talking about rap competition and rap, you know, rapping. Like, what was the last thing Drake said that got you out your seat, that got you excited? Let me know. Wickman. What? The song Wickman. What'd he say? <laughs> that that I mean, like, really I mean, you could, play, you could play the record. I'm not going to just, like, recite it off, like, off the top, but, like, like those. Where like, is the, it bothers me when the guys get to acting like the 8 a.m. in Charlotte. I keep preaching to the dogs about changing their image. He said, he said, I leave, I leave, he said, I leave for tour. My fucking go to jail. Like and he's speaking real shit on ADM and Charlotte. Actually, people will be people keep going for uh, going uh, forgetting about that. Like he's speaking real so shit. So one of the Tom Stamp records that he usually goes off. On. Yeah, like it, he went off on ADM and Charlotte. Like he was pre, he was he was talking real shit on there. He was talking real shit on there. It doesn't matter. There's, what does it there's, matter? It's just a, there's a top five and then there's everybody else. It doesn't matter if if number two or number one and number three called out number one and number two called out number three. It doesn't matter. They're the only ones in the room. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just saying. So, is this the? Uh, I mean, matter. for me personally, like, I love Kendrick. Like, I love Kendrick, but he can't be my like. He can't be my, personally can't be my goat because he drops. He dro- He doesn't. He doesn't drop enough. Like, he. I, we want like. That's what I say. It just goes back to the early 2000s. Yo, those artists dropped every year. Like every single year. Jay Z was dropping an album every summer. Nas was dropping. I mean, I know he took a break too, but these artists, these great artists, you know what I'm saying? Nah, we got to go back to look at the legendary status that these artists pushed the game to. They was dropping. They wasn't taking no breaks for three, four, five years, six years. And I love Kendrick. No, that's that's a fact. But everything he drops is a classic, though. I agree. I completely agree with that. But we need more. Like I said, what's your most valuable asset? Your catalog. And Drake got a big ass motherfucking catalog. No, that's what I'm saying. Is this the end of Drake being that guy with the catalog on top? No. No? I don't think so, personally. I think it can be. I think it can be. I mean, how if Kendrick don't drop? Somebody else. And that's what I want to see what Cole does. Because Kendrick and Cole, I haven't seen haven't seen that battle or that little exchange. I want to see what Cole does. Cole definitely got to get more. Cole definitely got to get more respect, um, for sure, as like a lyricist because Cole is, like, I mean, Joe, like, Budden kind of said it like earlier, like on first person shooter, like, you know, Drake was kind of like, he probably heard Cole's joint was like, yeah, I can't like. Look <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean. the combo because like, yeah, on the top of your head, who's your top five? Off the top of your head. Oh goodness. Like, Currently, right now, including like the Jay Z's of, of the world, like and Kanye. I mean, top five. I mean, in no particular order. Definitely Cole, Drake, Kendrick. Um, who's who's after that? Like, that's really that. I because I listen to people. On, yo, you probably gonna laugh. I like Larry June. I like Larry June. Like, I'm talking about people that I can listen to. And um, but you're talking about like mainstream. Yeah, like mainstream. Like you're talking about like mainstream. I'm in top four. You see, it's just thirty, right? Oh, well, you got <laughs> Meek. Matter. I mean, Meek is good too. He got, he got, <laughs> he said he's not in there. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> he said wait, he's not in there. Wait, why is he not in there? He said Meek is not in there. He's got catalogs. Yeah, he does have he a catalog. He has hits. He does have a catalog. He got bars. He's not in there. He may be a little off <laughs> on the socials. He said he's not in there. He's not in there. He's I, I, not in there. I love Meek. He's the most guy. Um, we're talking about, we're not talking about the top like 10 rappers of all time or even top six. You're talking about currently, right? I said top five. That's like, that's a big, that's a, you're in the Raptors. You have, you have rings. Like Big Sean? Talking, Big Sean up there? Big Sean is there. W- Wale? But he hasn't dropped. I mean, I fuck with Big Sean, but he hasn't it's, dropped. It's more of a skill thing for Big Sean. Okay, yeah, like, it is, it put is. Put that man in the room and yeah, he does. a little nervous. He does, so, he does. Big right. Sean's there. I don't know if he's four or five or six, but he's, 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 he's floating. I agree with Wale? that. 
Yeah, Wale doesn't Wale's get enough respect. No, Wale's got to be in there. He's top 10. No, nah, Wale don't get enough respect. He got records. Wale got records. Wale got records. Wale got records. All right, we, we were off topic, but we, we don't resume this on. I'm just saying, this is this is an ongoing thing right now. We're waiting for Drake to respond, Cole to respond. This is, this is happening real it's time. Just three, it's just three guys. It's just three guys out here. But that's what Kendrick says. No big three. It's just big me. I mean, you got to drop more to me. For it. I love Kendrick, <laughs> but you just got to drop more. Flood the streets, which he probably will. I'm not, I'm not saying he probably will. I'd rather him not drop, the drop what Drake would drop. I'll say that. I mean, Drake is a cool guy. You know that he's going to drop records like that. He's a cool guy. All That's right. his thing. Let's transition. We have a few more. Of course. That's, that's a legend. Rappers. He's in the rap. Yeah, he's in the, he's, like, he's like, he's in the. He's excluded. Yeah, he's yeah. excluded. Yeah, he's with Jay-Z and them. Exactly. He's with Jay-Z and them. He's with Jay-Z and them. With He's got the flute. He's, got- <laughs> He's with Jay-Z. Oh, man, we still have a lot of stuff to hit. But I wanted to touch on sports betting a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the emergence of sports betting, it's getting really big. There's DraftKings. There's all these different platforms you can place bets on. Caesars. It's Caesars. And then from, let's talk about the legality. You can actually do it now in, in more states, right? Not all. Not all of them, but like most, more states than you could have before, right? So now it's, it's emerging. Uh, I guess... Media now is promoting it too, like go place your bets. It's, it's they're getting analysts to talk about it. It's not just like commercials anymore. It's it's getting good, right? They're they're believing in the business of sports betting, and then players from MLB, from NBA. So Sean Gatana, uh, the base MLB player, his translator has gotten in trouble. Shohei, placing bets. what's his name? Shohei. Yeah, Shohei Otana. His so he's gotten in trouble for placing bets. Uh, he said he, does, he didn't know anything about it. Michael Porter Jr., the forward on the Denver Nuggets, his brother, the Don, uh, Dante Porter, I believe, yeah. got in trouble for placing unders. So the thing was that he, was, he, I think he had four points, three rebounds, something like that. And it was like they placed an under for 20000 on him getting basically three rebounds or less. So right? he was betting on himself. <laughs> yeah, so he got sick during the game. <laughs> and then they place the $20,000 oh, yeah. nah, bet. Nah, nah, you can't do uh, that. I think yeah, on yeah, unders, you're yeah, only yeah. supposed to place, like, you can go up to, like, 2000 So it happened, like, twice. So it got flagged. And the reason why we're talking about it on this pod is because I'm thinking about sure. all these sports betting platforms are a piece of tech, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they're hammering everybody on the tech side to understand and flag these things, right? From an equitable standpoint, we don't want, we don't want bad betting on our platforms, mm-hmm. right? So the technology, I feel, is going to get even better. I think people are going to get caught on the same day, same hour, <laughs> a minute pass by. This took a couple months and was like actual investigation. But I think you're going to start to see you can't cheat sports betting in the future. Or mm-hmm. What do you think about sports betting in the future? Do you guys, I don't know if you guys bet on sports, but like, what do you, how do you think that's going to move? Uh, it's definitely going to be more active and more in, interactive. And it's going to get better, as you said. I don't sports bet because just because I'm, I'm I plan to be an owner someday, so I'm not I don't want to get started and stuff like that. You know, I, I don't sports bet, but that's what's getting that's what's driving the revenue. That's what's driving more people into sport. That's why the Super Bowl's big. That's why March Madness is crazy because people like to bet on it. People like to see the outcomes. So I get it. But now, what what are we gonna do with the players? We see uh, Calvin really got a year suspension because he was betting yeah. on sports. In the NFL, Calvin Ridley. Shout out to Calvin Ridley. He's nice though. I but, think um, that's the issue is how can we <laughs> the players want to eat too? I guess that's the, really the, the, the problem we're seeing. I think uh part of, I think <laughs> what's gonna happen, well, to answer your question, yeah, sports betting is really big. Um it's gonna continue to grow. Um, uh, but you can't have players or people or necessarily play people around the players betting because that does kind of undermine the integrity of the game a little bit. And you know, from a fan's perspective. Um, if the players that are participating in the game that you're betting and you know that the people around them are profiting off, that's kind of messing up the integrity of the game. So um, you always got, no matter, no matter how much revenue you're making, um, you can't compromise the integrity of the game. Um, so I'll take that stance. Um, and then knowing, and then just thinking about sports betting in general, um, Hold on, what was, this, what was the other part you said? So we see it going, because like... Yeah, no, it's definitely going to be... I, I could definitely see, it like, um, sports betting becoming more, like, live and interactive, um, especially if you're at the stadium, like, um, in certain states that allow it. I could probably see more of, like, a like how people go to Vegas and go sit down and go bet at the thing, like, live. I could probably start seeing, like, 
little sections and little pockets and arenas where they're just allowing that. Because that's going to drive more people to the stadium to go there live. Oh, so you could just you could just sports bet while the game, like. Yep. Okay. Games, Look, games just. Right. That's kind of cool, actually. <laughs> Somebody's about to break not, the record. They don't do that already. Don't they do that? No. no. I, don't do that. I think not it's just, you go, you see the game. You go, you see the game. I think for the Nets, uh, they had the virtual reality, and you can watch it in like uh, in three D or whatever it is. Like you're on the court, but you're like in, up in the like second or third level. They're, they're doing that at the game, but. <laughs> And you could be courtside, like on the on the VR. You could be courtside, yeah. but you're in the third. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So you're yeah. doing that. Mm. So I don't see why why they wouldn't integrate actual live betting. It's going to be like a casino. Exactly, in the in the arena. Yeah, yeah. I could be. And then they, maybe, maybe I'm not even going to talk about how you can monetize that because mm. you, you can really monetize <laughs> that. But uh, I ain't for about sure, that. it may have to be just a section for that for that type of. Activity. Don't even get too much into it. Don't yeah, even get too much for free. Don't get too much into it for free. Because then the, you're taking away from like the whole crowd type of field because people are going to be betting on different things that don't re, don't the relate to the outcome. Big, exactly. You know, and you can that's what I'm, Uber, don't get too much into it yeah, cause, okay. because you can really monetize that in a certain way. But I did want to talk about maybe yeah, yeah, what yeah, can yeah. they do to limit the players getting in trouble because of that. Is oh, that oh yeah, that's the, that's the next question for the NFL. At least in the NFL, because you know we're talking about equity, we're talking about being more equitable. So the next time it comes up where they have to do the NFL and NFLPA contracts. A part of that betting revenue should go to some of that. I'm not sure if it does. I'm not. I'm not. I don't know. I honestly don't. But I'm just saying, if they're if the owners are making extra cash off sports betting, they should definitely be you know divvying that up with the the teams and the players somehow. I don't know. Like I don't know how the I don't know how the structure is. But yeah, no, because equity is a real big thing. It's a real big thing, and um, you know that's how you keep that's how you keep people loyal, and that's how you keep people incentivized to continue to want to build and work with you is like giving them equity um, and yeah. real equity too. Like, you know, that would be, I don't know if, like you said, I don't know if that's going on, but that's a dope, that's definitely a dope idea. And uh, the player, like, would, if they do that, then would the players still be allowed to bet though? No, no. like, no, they, they, they shouldn't should. be bledding. I think they should be. You think? Play. No, yeah. because that compromises, no, that compromises so, so, the integrity so of the game. I get to, I don't want to use some example, but there are players in the NBA who have agents who own, uh, an agency that have players on it, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know that when that player retires, they're gonna own that agency. So how come I can have a little squad that bets on sports for me? I'm not doing the betting, I just have a little company that's placing bets for me. It's a little company. I don't know if that guy's gonna twist his ankle. Maybe I can't bet on games I'm in. Can but... agents even bet? Can agents bet? I'm pretty sure they can. Mm, probably not. Nah, like I haven't heard any kid. You can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're going to mess up the integrity of the game. You're going. You can't do that. You can't. This is why I don't fuck with betting. You can't do that. You can't it's do that. it's a slippery slope. Yeah, you can't do that. Um, yeah, one more topic, and then we're going to bring on our guests. But there's two things I wanted to hit on. Uh, let's see which one. Let's do this one. Uh, BYD. It's a Europe. It's a. I think they're a Chinese automaker. They make EV cars. I know. The right reason on. I'm I'm bringing them up is. They have really good price points for their vehicles. And they've been around for a long time. They started making batteries and then they shifted over to making actual automobiles. And the cars look pretty good. And I'm bringing it up because Tesla reported their earnings for Q4 and it dropped by a lot. And their, their uh, prices went up. And they're planning to enter the European and North American market. So Tesla is finally gonna have actual competition in the EV space. I think the folks that are here in the States today, like who's a real Tesla co competitor? Lucid? I mean, Lucid is- They price a lot. Yeah, the Lucid, Lucid, Lucid is, Lucid is a competitor, but Lucid, um, they kind of cater to like the higher end consumer oh, or higher end yeah. customer because their, pri their prices camera, are so high. Off camera, we'll talk about, I guess an area I'm interested in now, in, but off camera, just remind me. <laughs> What's the area? That, okay, off okay, camera. Okay, but just remind me. Okay, but but as far as like um, you talking about BYD and the Chinese and Chinese manufacturers um, uh, in the EV space, there's a couple actually. Neo is one, uh, NIO. Um, that's another one. Um, and their vehicles, their vehicles. Are... The car I couldn't remember last time was Vinfast, and it was a Vietnamese company. Not v I think I said Vietnam. Vietnamese. Yeah, it's called Vinfast. Oh, they're yes, an easy company, company too. I think they're starting to come into the states, but they don't have enough 
They make enough products. The only thing I'll say, the only thing I'll say is Tesla focused on simplicity. They did. Like, but now, because they had since had since they had such a head start, he was able to focus on simplicity. Now that it's going to start being adopted a little bit more, and probably, you know, Look, governments and stuff is going to be incentivized to get people to do it or whatever. They're the leader. They got in first, but the competitors are slashing prices. So they, they put and they look better. Come here, and they look better. To you for like ten thousand dollars. And they look better. Like a used car. <laughs> Getting a new car for ten thousand. What's Elon gonna do? And did y'all want to talk about his interview with John Lennon? Or? No. <laughs> yeah, no, no. We're, not, we're not even gonna get at that. We're not uh, doing no air on that. One. <laughs> but yeah, 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 Tesla's just definitely it got some competitors. It definitely, and you know, um, he knew it was coming. You know, he knows it was coming. It was just a matter of time. Um, that's probably why he even kept the prices high for so long. Because they gotta squeeze out, they gotta squeeze out as much revenue as they can um, before the real competition comes. Uh, and those those cars that they about to start importing from over there, they fire though. I ain't gonna lie. You see them? I never. Yeah, I see them. them. They fire. Yeah, Doppelink BYD. They look pretty good. They fire. Okay. They look pretty good. So Lantis too, but Lantis is running some more issues than another um, car maker. But there's a couple, but they they have some type of hurdle preventing them from. Breaking through, but BYD has no hurdles. They're back on these batteries. They make all their batteries, and that's and that's and that's a and and the probably reason why they don't have any uh any uh hurdles is because the batteries is the most essential part of the EV. So if they're the ones that's making it, we need those type of companies, or even have that background in making it. We need those type of companies. It's like Nvidia with the chips. Exactly. But the only thing with that, the only thing with Nvidia is we need more. we're going to need to build out more capacity, and we can't just have one. You know, Intel is a Intel is a um, legend in that space, um, but Nvidia just kind of came in and started beating them with smaller chips and design performance. But Intel is um, is a they're the they're the be- legacy. They, they're they're legacy exactly. Intel is a legacy, and then Nvidia is like the new the new guy. I guess I should say. Yeah, so we're gonna take a break here. Uh, we have other topics, but we'll get to it next time. Next time for our guests. Yes, yes, yes. We we're all black. We got the memo because we got a founder in the building. We got a CEO of a brand, black billionaires. You see it, how's the spirit? My man, Aunt Lava in the building. Aunt Lava in the building. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Social Currency Series. Let's get this money. What's up? Welcome to Social Currency. I'm all about the dollar. Let's get it. (laughs) Especially the black dollar. (laughs) See, I came ready. We need to get that mindset to come up with that brand. Uh, to me, Black Billionaire started, um, I actually started the company during the pandemic, and it comes from the mindset that we are all already Black Billionaires, you know what I'm saying? So you think about we stolen people with stolen land, so back in Africa, you know, if they took kings and queens and put us on boats and stole all our resources, we was already billionaires. So it's really re-emerging that mind state to the people to put it back into themselves that you already a billionaire, you don't... It's not so. It's about your mindset, not really, you know, not the materialism. Mm, I, I mean, love that. Really, putting a brand out there to empower the people. You know what I'm saying? So I, th- I feel like a lot of people wear brands that they don't know the history of what they wear. And people wear Marys or whoever, whoever, and wearing Balenciaga. They don't even know who the real Balenciaga is. You know what I'm saying? So really, for them to rep something, not just not just a brand, but rep themselves, and really to start a different type of conversation. So when I created the brand during the pandemic. I'm a real social person, you know what I mean? You know how we met, I'm out and about getting it lit, you know what I mean? Anybody know me and Lava in the spot turned up. So, you know, so it was like, we went into this non-social phase and like, how can I create something to make people actually socialize through fashion? Mm -hmm. So, you know, my marketing background, it was just like, how can I merge these two and take something like, okay, make people socialize, but then put it on clothes, but still make it cool. You know what I mean? And not really over fashionize it, you know? So I think like a lot of people wearing brands or designers is just giving you clown clothes and they just (laughs) mixing shit up, you know what I'm saying? And really don't really, we ain't gonna wear that. What is that, you know? So when we look at Fashion Week and all of these different runway shows and you don't see nobody walking down the street like that. That's what I always say. I've never seen somebody walking down the street like that. It's like watching Alice in Wonderland. (laughs) (laughs) This shit ain't real. (laughs) (laughs) 
you know? So it, it, it was really just taking it back to the essence of really being a native New Yorker, somebody who really loved fashion and really loved music and the culture and just hip hop in general. And, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, it was just like, it's time, you know? And I worked with many other brands in the past, independent brands, worked at Rockaware, worked with LRG, a bunch of, you know, household names in the fashion industry as well. And, and, and I worked on all sides. I worked in urban fashion. I worked in mass market fashion, which is the fashion that you get in Walmart and Target. So I understood the that's different dope. levels of the game and the different levels of the business. And that's why I felt like it was a good time for me to dive in and take it to the next level. So a follow-up question. So I think you touched on a little bit. Um, let's, we want to hear more about your background. So like, how did you, you know, get into fashion what was your inspiration right then behind fashion like tell us a little bit about your background where you started yeah i mean i started as an intern you know so i my i first did my first fashion show in high school wow you know what i'm saying and this is you know in the 90s and and back then all of the companies that did advertising their numbers used to be in the back of the magazine so if you look at the sauce or the vibe or all the double xl all these magazines we had like you could call them they was right there and then some of them had their address so me and my peoples went to the office <laughs> after they stopped you know like picking up pulling up i love it yeah you know and shout out to my man rico he was at pure players back then and tamiko at you know uh davucci and, and and the people over at dada you know what i'm saying That's so dope. all of these brands like, you know, gave me a chance a kid from high school and they was just like all right you got to sign this paper you got to bring the clothes back I'm a kid from Four Green Projects. They like, Shorty ain't coming back. <laughs> He's taking all of that. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it, it was really, that's what led me into the business. And then at the same time, interning on music videos. So shout out to, you know, Carl Verna, Pierre Verna. They gave me my first internship, you know really working on a music video. I have went to a mad skills video to be in the video and I'm actually in the video. So then from there, I saw this black man on the set and I'm like, I don't want to be an extra. I want his job. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and really just built that, you know, relationship with him. And he was like, you sure? All right. So show up here on this day at this time, if you really want to work. And I showed up. And from there, that kind of opened the doors and, and built relationships on both sides, the music video film side and got to interact with artists and people as well. And, you know, they filmed Hip Hop Parade in my projects. Wow. You know what I'm saying? That's so, in Fort Green? Yeah, that's in Fort Green. You know what I mean? I didn't know Spike that. Spike Lee shot that in the hood. Like, I didn't on know that. Sunday, we I didn't know Spike Lee shot church. that. And we came outside, saw that, was like, we going to change. <laughs> <laughs> we got to be in this, you know what I'm saying? So it was really, you know, those elements really woke me up and in, 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 in seeing it firsthand. And then from there, I was able to, based on the music videos, I was able to start street teaming because the mu music videos started slowing down. Mm -hmm. So you talking about big budget videos, like, you know, I worked on... Missy, I can't stand in the rain. Foxy Brown and Black Street, take me home. And, what? You know what I mean? That's yeah, my joke. Like, yeah, so you know, all these videos were like big budgets at that time, and then they, you know, started to slow down. But they wasn't every day, you know. So, and in, in between music videos, I was street teaming, and from there, you know, I just took it to the next level and started doing college radio and entertainment. When Un and Jacob York and them launched that label after, you know, Big Pass, they started entertaining Cam so so. and Charlie, you know what I mean? And really, that gave me my shot into doing radio and made me like a boss of my own. And I had my own street team and really took it to that next level. So I got a question. So just educate us a little bit or mm -hmm. educate people that may not be not may not know what street team is or right. what street team uh, you know, where it comes from, right? right. People might I mean, not even know yeah, street team, they call it guerrilla marketing now, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, I, I, I don't really agree with that term a little bit because I got my name Aunt Lava from climbing on top of the do not walk signs. So <laughs> that's where I used to put my stickers at. That's where my poster boards would be at. The people that work for the city ain't climbing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These kids is crazy. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, but that that's that's really the essence of the music, you know, that type of promo and that's what really changed and made the labels and a lot of artists dope because you think about you taking this group of kids from every ghetto in the city, putting them together with one mission, and they're bringing all the slang, they're bringing all the fashion, they're bringing that to the office for free. Mm -hmm. And then when the artists and the executives, they 
not in the streets every day. Yeah. So at the end of the day, the artists come in there and see these kids dressing a certain way and using a certain type of slang, then what he does, he goes in the studio, take their slang, then goes and make a video, take their fashion, and then it becomes mainstream. So it was really like free marketing for the labels, but then it was a way for, you know, us to really learn the business as an intern and work our way up. So a lot of people that are executives today, they came from the street team and worked their way up to those different departments, Facts. whether it's A and R, whether it's head of this, head of that. They all came from that one group of people, and that was the street team. That's true. Sure. Sure. And actually, we want to talk about the people that you saw, you know, guide you up the, the up the ladder. Right. People like Dame Dash you worked with, you right, worked right, for, right. and how was his influence on you to come out and now be your own boss as he preaches. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, during my time at Rockefeller, I started as the national director of promotions and then I was later promoted to the head of promotions for all their brands. So that was like Rockaway, Pro Cads, Armadale, the films, wow, the jewelry, whole, the, jewelry. Yeah, everything, you know. Wow. So I think seeing his vision of we can sell anything with our culture and that power that we had, that's what kind of empowered me and what made me different coming in with my marketing tactic was, how do we now cross pollinate all of these brands together? So, you know, that's what made me influential there it was like, okay, you're gonna give me this artist budget, say it's a half a million dollars, but Rockaway is spending $5 million. How do I now get some of that $5 million to spend in my department? So now really coming together and working with all the brands to say, this artist is going on tour. Where does it make sense? And now cut that dollar into 10 cent for that artist or 15 cent with those bigger brands and now picking up the bigger cost of that brand. So, you know, seeing him just really work in all of those different mediums, whether it was music, fashion, jewelry, films, all at the same time. And, you know, big shout out to Dane because he's a, he empowered so many young people. And he let us do what we wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? So he wasn't the type of boss that would micromanage you. It's like, all right, Lava, your budget 250, go make it happen. Don't go over the budget, but I'm not going to sit there and have to approve everything every step of the way. Once you come with a good plan, they're going to approve your budget, now go attack. So I think that's what led to the success and led to the legacy of why people still arguing about Rockefeller records almost 20 years later. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's That's like, it, it, was, it, it was that influential. And, and, and still, there is no label to this day that had that power or has that power, even after. No. I agree. And that just for even saying he's talking, um, it's a micromanaging and everything. Now they call that autonomy. They give right. you autonomy, but right. you're just saying they empower. That's That's... And I think, and I think, as leaders, that's that's so great of him to, you know, see the work ethic and see the drive that you know these young people had, right. and give them that opportunity because that's what honestly a lot of people just need is just that one opportunity. Right. Right. It's to like just showcase, like, man, right. I could do something. You right. know, I, I mean, it's about empowering the next generation. You know what I'm saying? So you know, you look at so many different people that if this person didn't put them on, and then they come back in their career and also help that next person. So exactly. I think, you know, that's kind of what's missing from the game now in all lanes of business. But Paying I think it forward. that's what made Virgil so dope, you know, because he was able to work with other young designers and keep the essence of the youth in the streets and give them a chance and believe in it. And they can see their ideas come to life mainstream through him. So I think, you know, any good, smart business person is going to empower that or see that and use that as an asset. That is very true. And that's what that's a social currency. Exactly. Now we're going to pay that forward. Facts. Now, is there anything you 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 could see in the game today that, like you said, the street team is almost non-existent? Right. You you want to bring back part of the reason why you have pillows because you want to make things more tangible. Facts. Go back mm -hmm. to more of a Facts. digital space that we are now. So talk Facts. about it. Talk about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, in in fashion, I just really wanted to break the mold. That's why I haven't really done a fashion show yet. And shout out to Kalia Clark. She's put us in tons of shows from New York Fashion Week to Art Basel to Paris Fashion Week. So, you know, the brand is out there. But me, myself, like we have a home collection show coming up or art show. I'm going to introduce this on here. <laughs> so it's like really changing the business model. You know what I'm saying? So I felt like, you know, if I did what the traditional fashion houses did, then I wouldn't be able to stand out. 
you know? So I think, you know, by doing the pillows and by doing glow in the dark pieces or just, you know, all of these different pieces that people say, why would you make that? Why would you do that? It's just like, well, how many more t-shirts and hoodies, which we have and we're going to continue to make, but you have to expand your brand outside the bottom line. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And really look for other streams of revenue to expand the company and that extra revenue helps the company. <laughs> it helps the company <laughs> grow and function. Right. Continue. And, and it brings in new consumers as well. So somebody might see the pillow and not know that it's a clothing line and say, oh, no. Well, they got hats, they got jackets, they got this, they got that. So I think really just really breaking that mold and I'm working on some other crazy stuff now too. So <laughs> Can we get a little insight or not? Nah, nah, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> they might steal it. Yeah, yeah, you, right. you know, the internet is reckless. <laughs> yeah. I'll be scrolling right. through the gram like, I got to find you, son. That's right, that's right, that's right. Man, anybody got any, any questions? I probably, I think I got one more. You know, what's the biggest difference, you know, that you see in, um, you know, marketing and how it was back then and like how it is like today in 2024? Like, or let me frame it a little better. Like, how can we how can we um, be more creative when it comes to marketing in um, 2024 and stop like not stop, but like these um, just kind of just refining these new ways that we do have to market, but how can we add a little bit more, anything that you just want to share, any cre more creativity to marketing? I think it got to get a, get back to IRL and that's in real life. I think so many people are caught up on the perception of social media with the fake numbers, but that perception doesn't necessarily mean profit. So, you know, you can have somebody put up a flyer for something or put up something and they get all these likes and then you go to the venue and it's them and they one homeboy there. And it's like, yo, but dog, you got 3,000 likes and comments on this. Like, but the kid that got 50, he really has 35 people there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I think it's about taking it back to kind of that street team mentality where you actually get out and interact with the people and introduce the people because still word of mouth is still the number one marketing tool and it's actually all businesses is an exchange of energy so we can't get that energy through the phone and through the technology sadly versus somebody actually putting you on to it and you see somebody with something but what's that oh yo this the so-and-so so-and-so like versus you just seeing right the billboard or the poster it's like how many billboards we see a day but then we don't go on our phones and look that up. We don't, yeah. it's about when you see somebody with it. Exactly. You know? So I think, I think, you know, any creative or any business person has to really find out how to really organically reach their target audience in real life so that they can experience their energy. And those people are now going to take that energy back and go spread it out all over. The so place. having a balance between like the offline presence and the online presence, because sadly, sadly, I, like, I agree with you. I'm more of like an in real life type of person. Right. I like interacting with people in real life. Right. But, you know, we have to use the mediums that are available to right. us. So but you're saying more of like having the balance between the both. Right. Because a lot of people on the Internet are introverts. So it's just like they don't they can do that in their home and on their phone. But when you put them in a social setting, they're in a corner because they don't really know how to interact with the people. So I think those that really go out and interact with the people look at somebody like a Shiggy. You know, he goes out, he dances, he does this, he does that, versus other cats that they don't do that. Yeah. They stay in their crib and they just streaming for hours and days and days. And days. Yeah. But then when they come out, they scared of the people. They like, what's going on? Who's this? What's that? You know what I mean? So I think, you know, going out and really just being yourself. And, and, and I think COVID sent a lot of more people back in the house. So, you know, it's time to come outside. <laughs> it's time to come outside and, try and, show, and, and really engage with the people in real life. It's almost right? summertime. It's time to come outside. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. That's a fact. Um, you know, any last words or anything else that you would like to just share about Black Billionaires um, collection? And where can the people, actually, matter of fact, how can the people find you? Where can they go get this stuff at? Yeah, for like, sure. Let us know. Yeah, nah, definitely follow us on Instagram at, uh, at Black Billionaires Collection is the official name of the brand. Also follow me at Ant Lava NYC. Our website is we'reblack.onuniverse.com. And, you know, we just outside. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, 
I got some gifts got? for y'all. Yeah, what else? Oh wow. You know what I'm saying? So definitely, nah. You know, y'all gonna y'all gonna pick and choose through these since y'all already got on all black. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna take it. Okay. Appreciate that. This is we love. Just, we just dropped this. We demand more 2024 jacket. Yeah, the oh, that's fire. You know what I mean? This is also available in black. That is fire. So, you know, with the embroidered patches on it. That is fire. You know what I mean? And you know, and that just, just dropped. That yeah, just yeah, dropped. Yeah, yeah, this just okay. dropped. This just dropped. You know? That's fire. You also got the get your hands out my pocket, Jay. <laughs> get your hands out my pocket. Get your hands out my pocket, man. Malcolm X, Jay. You know what I mean? Get your hands yeah. out my pocket. No handouts or a hustle. No handouts, man. I like this one. I'm definitely copping this one. I'm definitely copping this one. You know, the navy with the white. And yeah, I'm just working on the summer collection right now. We got the sweats out. This one of the new sweats out. One of the new hats out. So this is all the spring stuff, working on the summer stuff, and just really building. You know, we got a lot of different shows coming up. We doing Miami Swim Week coming up. Mm, that's love. A bunch of other shows, and you know, just just staying focused. You know, big shout out to everybody that's been supporting the brand all over the world. Big shout out to Now What TV, Kalia Clark. Uh, I don't want to forget nobody. Man. Hip Hop Closet too. Hip Hop Closet. Fox Hip -Hop. And, yeah, and down in Miami. April Young Walker. Six. Big shout out to Steph Loving, the whole Live and Direct crew. You know what I mean? My crew, Crizzo, LB, Buzzing. You know, and everybody that just hold it down, man. Like. We outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to go cool. inside, definitely cop a pillow too. <laughs> yeah. oh, nah, you, nah, nah. You, these are great for the crib, the car, you know, and Mother's Day is coming up. You Get know, your mom. Father's Day is coming up. <laughs> That's facts. That's facts. You know, nice. So it, 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 if you don't like it for yourself or need it for your crib, then you definitely could, you know, give it to somebody else. It's a nice gift. You That's know? a nice gift. For the gift. office, it all works exactly. all over the place. That's facts. <laughs> Maybe if you if you work if you work in office. Black billionaire pillows, get your, get your seat, get your back right. You know, get your back right. You, you start sitting up, you start sitting up, start thinking right and shit, you mean? Yeah, it's, it, it's, about, it's about your mindset, you know? So it's all about empowering the people and giving the power back to the people. And that's what I've always been about, you know? So, you know, the forces might work against me, but, you know, almost three decades since interning, I'm still here. Still here. Myself, you know, that's from street team. And look how many artists is not here today. You know, look how many brands are not here today. So I think, you know, it's about what you think about yourself and putting that foot forward and believing in it. And I'm going to continue to believe in myself and the people that support me. Like, y'all, thank y'all for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah, hello, you know, man. You definitely got to come back, too. You got a lot of war stories. Yeah, I know. You, you, you being modest. You being modest right now. You being modest. But no, I appreciate you. Um, and this, this is just um, even as a quick shout out, because, you know, we're all about collaboration. We're all about supporting you know, different brands. I got a shout out, you know, a Nigerian brand right here, <laughs> based in, uh, based in uh, uh, California. It's Aura, oh, it's, oh, it's Aura Oga. So Aura okay. Oga, so Oga in Nigerian or, Cal or in Pigeon English means like boss or like, big you know, man. big man. They be like big okay, man. So okay. like how we got the black billionaire, right, right, it's like right. big man. Like this is a big man right here. Okay. So we'll call you Oga. We got we got we got we got to switch the me? lingo in the street. Let's make that pop. <laughs> got the old guy. And then one last, you know, oh shout out God. to the custom Air Force One straight from Geneva, Switzerland. Wow, my okay. people out oh, there, yeah, uh, told your story. You know, get tap in. It's a good shot. It's a good shot. The best or nothing. You know, shout oh, out man. to them. You see, so we all about collaboration, bigging each other up. And so it's, we all need it. We all need the support. Yeah, so that's no why doubt. we all supporting each other. So we love you know the empowerment. I mean? We love the community aspect. Right. We all continue, continue to keep uh, doing. No it. doubt. And that's why it's an S on the end. It's not. It's not just black billionaires. billionaires. Yeah, exactly. It's, I want everybody to have bread. Break bread with everybody across the globe, and that makes us all better. Exactly. And that's why. Yeah. Episode five: Social currency. And we'll lava. see you. And lava. In the building, black business. Brooklyn uh -huh. in the building. What are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>